hear me. Hi, welcome back. I hope you all had a good lunch break and feel refreshed and ready for the second part of the day. Uh, we will now, before we start into the next panel, we will now have a short presentation uh, of an ongoing Eurozine uh, book project and also online focal point called um, The Legacy of Division. I'm happy to introduce very briefly to you the two editors of this project. Uh, Ferenc Lotso, a Hungarian scholar of intellectual and political history, who is currently an assistant prof uh, professor of history at the University of Maastricht. And then uh, we also have here sitting uh, Luka Lisiak uh, Gabrielcic. Now I practice it and still get it wrong, I'm sorry. Pardon my Slovenian, but uh, who is a Slovenian historian and an editor of uh, Raspotia, a Slovenian quarterly journal and, of course, a Eurozine member journal as well. Uh, a fairly new one, I think. I haven't heard the name in the past for so long, but uh, I've seen the covers uh, in, in the hall, and I'm very happy that you two are here and uh, are going to introduce to us this new focal point. Uh, good afternoon from the two of us as well. Uh, to counterbalance the cliches that surround so many historical anniversaries, intellectuals prefer to deconstruct grand narratives. They tend to venture into unexplored territory to extract gems of insight from seemingly obscure details. Such exercises may satisfy the erudite, but leave the broader public seeking clarification over more fundamental issues. On the 30th anniversary of the collapse of communist regimes in Eastern Europe, Eurozine has therefore decided to organize a discussion among engaged spectators that addresses precisely this demand. Our aim as guest editors of the focal point, the legacy of division, East and West after 1989, was to combine the scholarly knowledge accumulated over the past three decades with an essayistic style. Contributions to our focal point with their diverse approaches, perspectives, emphases, and arguments all revolve around a single crucial question. How has Europe's East-West division been overcome, transformed, or reproduced since 1989? That 1989 is a key date in contemporary European history is uncontested. The utterances and politics of key participants the resulting memorial practices and the dominant historical interpretations have generally pointed to the same conclusion. Namely, that the key achievement of the revolutions of 1989 was to have ended the division of Europe. Even the recovery of political freedoms in the East has often been treated as a mere corollary of this. Whereas the consequences of the upheavals were far from uniform or uniformly positive, an event of great magnitude and diversity has nonetheless come to be largely defined by a single image, the fall of the Berlin Wall, as you all know. It would be a mistake to see the narrative of European unification as a conscious and exclusive effort of canonization on the part of Western European elites. This is not to say that the project of further integration wasn't catalyzed by the downfall of communist regimes and the widely and anachronistically feared reunification of Germany. But the power of the European narrative was more the result of convergent aspirations. When the Cold War suddenly ended, both halves of the continent declared in unison their intention to overcome the legacy of division. East Europeans were eager to condemn their recent past, though not necessarily to examine it, and were especially keen on asserting their Europeanness. Westerners, too, hoped to see the former Eastern Bloc transformed and then absorbed into an, an enlarged and ever closer union. Mutual ignorance and deep-seated misconceptions were believed to be no more than temporary hindrances along this path. After 1989, a conviction took hold that the Cold War had been an anomaly in European history 
The Iron Curtain may have contributed to a perception of differences between the two halves of the continent, and for more than a generation turned these differences into basic facts of life, but the East-West divide was said to have been an artificial construct. This was to ignore that despite being restricted to one side of the Iron Curtain, the supranational integration projects launched in Western Europe from the early 1950s onwards increasingly claimed to represent Europe as a whole. And these projects drew on long-standing traditions in Western European thought that marginalized or even excluded the experiences of the continent's eastern half. In the euphoria following 1989, it was similarly overlooked that structural differences between various macro regions of Europe had a history stretching back much further than the post-war decades. If European integration was to stand any chance of success after the end of the Cold War, a more inclusive narrative of the past was required. Not only was it necessary, as post-colonial authors argued, to decolonize Eurocentric visions of the world. As critical scholars from Eastern Europe added, there needed to be a deprovincialization of Western Europe in order to avoid reproducing developmental civilizational hierarchies and stigmatizations within the continent. Today, former hopes for a swift and successful merging of Europe's East and West seem unrealistic at best. The financial and economic crisis of 2008 led to a crisis of the Eurozone, which halted the process of economic convergence in the East. The worsening of relations between Russia and the West in more recent years has challenged Europeans' confidence in a peaceful future. Several Eastern European states are associated with the global revival of authoritarianism, while nationalistic forces and xenophobic politicians enjoy growing support across the continent. The idea of a social Europe, a constitutive part of the ideals of 1989, has largely been frustrated by the crises and turmoil of the past decade. Warning signs appeared as early as the mid-2000s, when the liberal consensus of the previous decade first began to be seriously challenged. In Eastern Europe, grievances were directed against the prevailing narratives of transition, which relegated the societies that had been on the wrong side of the Iron Curtain to the role of imitating the West. A new political discourse gained hold that incorporated the legacy of division into exploitable grievances. In recent years, these controversial projects have come to be perceived as potential models by counterparts further west, an unexpected reversal in the direction of transfer of political ideas and political styles. As a result, the possibility of convergence between Europe's two halves has been reconceived as a threat to the liberal democratic order and the European project. In Western Europe, voices reg regretting the EU's supposedly careless and premature expansion eastwards began to appear on both sides of the left-right divide. In Eastern Europe, nationalist forces have continued to assert their Europeanness, however, with an ever clearer ethnic and even racial undertones and in opposition to a supposedly post-national and multicultural Western Europe. Europe, that fluid signifier that served as a centripetal ideal in 1989, has thus re-emerged as a highly contested notion. Professional and personal contacts across the line that once divided the continent are certainly more frequent and more intimate than ever. However, these engagements have also played a part in various backlashes. Today, there thus exists a curious mixture of greater mobility and sustained ignorance. Notions of Western decadence, reminiscent not only of the propaganda of communist regimes, but also far-right discourses from before 1945, have been revived across large parts of Eastern Europe. At the same time, Potent tropes with similar Cold War echoes have been used to warn against the authoritarian threats from the East. 
The presence of Eastern Europeans in British society played a major part in the Brexit campaign, while the Union's faith in the prospect of further enlargement appears to have largely eroded. Such complex and often paradoxical trends make it all the more urgent to ask what has happened to Europe's East-West division since the end of the Cold War and the implosion of communist regimes. How have the perceptions and misperceptions between the two halves of the continent changed since 1989? Question number one. Is there reason to talk of a new East-West divide? And if so, what characterizes it and why has it re-emerged? Conversely, how have the hopes of overcoming this divide been realized over the past three decades? As guest editors of Eurozine, we pose these questions to authors with an intimate and nuanced understanding of East-West relations and a reputation for original insights into contemporary European and to some extent global history, politics and culture. We are fortunate to have several of them here with us today. These broad questions were meant to enable a shift of focus in a transnational and relational direction. We trusted that addressing these questions would enable a substantial discussion of the legacies, the expectations, but also the unexpected developments that have defined the post-Cold War decades. We also hoped that these questions would foster original reflections on mutual perceptions and misperceptions and their role in determining these processes. Thank you, Ferenc. So let me uh, try to give you a sense of some of the key arguments by devoting just a few words to just a narrow section of uh, individual contributions in the volume. Uh, so you will know where to turn if you wish to find out more, and I hope you will. Um, as I said at the beginning of the book, uh, probe the realities of uh, East-West differences after 1989 and the various uh, misperceptions at the root uh, in the at least nominally re reunified Germany as well as in Europe more broadly. While uh, these first essays show how East-West differences have largely been reproduced and how decisions taken very early on in the post-Cold War period have been largely responsible for this, uh, other authors ex um, explore newer fault lines and new complexities. Florian Bieber, for example, emphasizes that as Europe has become more unidirectional, it has also become a more dangerous marketplace of ideas. According to this alternative perspective, uh, shared by several other uh, contributors, Europe's East and West ha may have converged in a negative as much as in a positive sense. Uh, other authors place the discussion of East-West in a global context, interpreting the Cold War as a confrontation that made it almost impossible to conceive of a political alternatives beyond the communist liberal binary. Approached in this manner, the decades in global history since 1989 have shown, contrary to Francis Fukuyama's predictions, that it is possible to separate capitalism from liberalism and to embrace elements of free market without political liberalization. As Neil uh, Chitalen uh, perceptively argues, overcoming the East-West divide was typically understood as the replacement of one side by the other. And if that failed, it is because the global victory of liberal democratic West was largely illusory. At the same time, he warns us that the currently fashionable narrative of a, globally spread, uh, of a global spread of illiberalism originating from the East merely reserve, uh, reverses the direction of supposed replacement and can easily sound conspirational. Uh, in the next part of the volume, it's, the next part of the volume is more autobiographical in character, and we find Julia Zonenwendt, uh, who offers an insight into intergenerational communication across the former East-West divide. She argues that while the East-West division in the Cold War sense is largely incomprehensible to young people today, the prevalence of wall building in the 21st century means that division and forced separation have been defining experiences for them. Tragically, acute fears at the borders have only become more widespread since the fall of the Berlin War. As Jaroslaw Kuish explains, uh, what has changed, though, is that Eastern Europeans have increasingly returned the gaze, contributing to a salutary demy demystification of an imaginary West of democracy and plenitude. 
As he argues, willing imitation of the West has largely given way to defiance in Eastern Europe and has yielded an, an entirely new set of political challenges in Europe as a whole. The volume closes with two wide-ranging conversations that reflect on several major themes in the previous essays. In the first of them, Ivan Krastev, who will be our guest today, or tomorrow, uh, offers numerous timely insights into, into imitation by invitation and its discontents in Central and Eastern Europe more generally, the post-89 moment of liberal hegemony and the confounding political reversals since. In the final conversation between Igor and Peter Pomerantsev, father and son, examines the troubled relationship between Russia and everything west of it in the light of multiple theories from the study of politics, literature and psychology, wondering how this mutually constitutive and disadvantageous, disadvantageous relationship could be improved. So both of us, your editors, were respectively born in a uh, non-aligned and, and that would be me, and an Eastern Bloc state during the last phase of the Cold War. Um, we, grew up, we grew up after 1989 amidst war and transition. We were merely young adults in the early years of this century when much of Europe appeared to become increasingly unified and the categories of East and West seemed to have, to, seemed to have lost much of their former meaning and relevance. As the evolving relationship between East and West have had, such a marked, uh, have had such a marked and varying impact on our lives, we have both observed the worsening relations between the two halves of the continent with surprise and growing concern. This has uh, provided us with a strong personal motivation to envision this focal point and to initiate a discussion of contemporary issues rooted in the decades of acute divergence in European history. Given that cultural and intellectual exchanges across Europe have greatly intensified in recent decades, to which Yurzen has made a significant contribution of its own, we are confident that the responses would add up to a meaningful corpus. At the same time, we are fully aware that our exchange might reflect the preoccupations of intellectuals more than those of European societies at large. When the shape of our future appears less clear that, uh, than at any previous anniversary of 1989, such moments of intellectual retrospection can hopefully help us to find an urgently needed orientation. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank, thank you very much, uh, you two, for presenting us this uh, ongoing um, focal point. I think it is good and important to see, uh, also for all of you who are not members of the Eurasian Network, to see that, uh, get a little insight into the day-to-day -day work at a transnational um, network of cultural journals. And of course, um, there is an annual conference, but in between the conferences, um, during the 360 and something other days, there's uh, journals from um, all over Europe exchanging text and uh, putting focal points together and from time to time launching bigger editorial projects. Um, so this was just um, a little hint at this uh, everyday work of the network.